so Carl mentioned a, a, a really important point um, in his previous uh, session, which is that a lot of educators who are starting to become curious about open educational resources ask themselves, yes, but there's a lot of stuff out there, pedagogical materials. How do we know if they're viable materials? Is this something that I can trust? And this has been a big issue, right? So starting when first materials came out, they were, they were just, you know, there, there's been this explosion. So for the flight uh, approach and for the flight project, we've developed a system when we, we Carl had uh, indicated to you that there's a, um, a, a list of editorial board members. So people, language program directors, people who have been um, kind of curious and working uh, uh, in this kind of vein who understand uh, the objectives then act as reviewers. And we have a very it's professional development, so it's not about rejection or acceptance of, of your lessons. It's about helping, to, helping you to actually publish your lesson. What, what might be missing? What can you tweak? We're going to give you professional feedback. So we also have a, um, a, a handout, which we'll be giving you soon. I'm, uh, oh, OK, I wasn't going to go there quite yet. Oh. Sorry. Um, don't peek. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Of course, if you have the handout, everyone starts looking at the handout. In any case, um, this uh, checklist um, is really the, the kind of criteria that, um, well, actually, it serves two purposes. It's the criteria that the, that the reviewer wants to look at to make sure that you have successfully, and uh, it's got a, a Likert scale, uh, to the degree of success that you've incorporated that in your lesson. But there are also other questions that are then included with each category to help the reviewer to think about additional feedback that he or she may wish to provide. So in a few moments, we're going to take a look specifically at the, the criteria. And afterwards, when we get to the application session, you're going to work with someone who has not yet seen your lesson. And you're going to do a peer uh, kind of feedback using these criteria to see, oh, where might you go? And understanding, of course, that this isn't a polished lesson yet. But just these ideas of, hmm, where might you need to go uh, uh, to better satisfy this? Or, oh, yeah, this, this part really seems to fit uh, what they're looking for here, et cetera. Before we do that, though, I wanted to just kind of go back and give a little bit of a summary of the broad strokes or the broad goals of, uh, of the uh, approach. And this is going to kind of summarize uh, what we've been um, looking at up until now. So, and this responds to a number of different questions that have come up uh, um, in, in our discussions with you. So the first goal is reinforcing. So what, what is the flight approach? What are we trying to do? The first goal is reinforcing norms and conventions. Now you might say, well, that sounds counterintuitive. You keep talking about the literary. How come you're now talking about reinforcing norms and conventions? Well, here's a quote. The pleasure we experience from linguistic deviation in everyday language depends upon our knowledge of the norms and conventions of ordinary usage. Deviation only becomes pleasurable and interesting, and I added here, and utilizable for language learners when we know what it deviates from. So at the introductory level, it's not about overwhelming your students with all of the possibilities that something, you know, meaning, uh, it's endless, right? It's infinite, the way that we can construe meaning. But as you're introducing, and, and so my textbook initially was meant as a complement, a supplement to Français Interactif. So what I wanted to do was to say Français Interactif introduces and scaffolds very nicely the literal uh, meanings and uses and functions of grammar, for example, in the gra grammar syllabus. And so actually I, I would change a little bit, Carl, what you said earlier about communicative language teaching does, language, uh, does grammar play, but we want to do more with other kinds of play. They don't do grammar play, yeah, right. right? So what they do is literal, do very well literal, literal understanding of, of, of grammar and, and everything else at these I, lower I levels. I okay. I completely agree with you. <laughs> We, we it's okay. Play. Just for the record, for we the record. We just do grammar, <laughs> grammar, not right. play. It does right. grammar, but not right. grammar play. And that was the thing. I mean, I love grammar play. I mean, that, that is really my, my entrance point into my whole concept of flight was really about, ah, but grammar, they just don't get what's going on here with the grammar. So anyway, um, so 
the idea is that at the introductory levels, along with introducing the norms and the conventions for grammar, for genre, for whatever it is that you're looking at, or cultural products and processes, is that you want to at least show one example, one way that you can play with that system in order to generate meaning. It's not an end in itself either. It just opens them up to, ah, there is this kind of inherent flexibility to language. And it means that as they're developing over the course of each lesson, uh, each unit, where along with the norms and conventions, you're showing one way of playing with it, is that they start to notice things about language. They start to become more open, more flexible, instead of being locked down. How, why is it that you say this in English when in my language we say this, or vice versa, whatever? No. Ah, right? And there are different ways of construing. So very important that the goal is nonetheless reinforcing norms and conventions, and then also uh, how to play with them. Another goal is expanding the communicative range and proficiency without increasing the quantitative load of grammar topics and vocabulary. A lot, so some people have said, yes, but I already have to do so much, right? It's not about giving more grammar, more vocabulary, if they learn how to foreground meaning with the structures and lexical items that they're already learning, you're accomplishing two things at the same time. And it just gives them a greater range of community. And that's the, in, the irony, too, for me, with the notion of communicative language teaching. It's not communicative, really, if you're only working with literal levels of meaning. Right? So let's make it, uh, let's build on that concept and include the literary. A third goal is fostering critical feeling along with critical thinking. So critical feeling, uh, Rolf uh, Reber, who is an interdisciplinary, it's an interdis interdisciplinary concept that, that he seems to be the, the kind of uh, generator of, uh, drawn from cognitive psychology, social psychology, and philosophy of education. I included here, I mean, eventually after this workshop, we're going to upload um, the PowerPoints, the, uh, the videos, and, and everything, so that you will have access to all of this information. Um, I included a little link for a short video where he talks about this concept of critical feeling, and I also included a link to Chantel's talk at UC Berkeley uh, on this topic. Chantel has done some really interesting work um, with critical feeling. Um, so, coming back to this notion of the musical metaphor, we also want in our, in our flight lessons to foster languicality along with languaging, right? So this notion of that kind of feeling for the melodies of, uh, uh, the harmony, sorry, of language along with the melodies. And, ha and how do we develop that sense of, of, of um, being a, we, we did improv yesterday, <laughs> to being able to do a little bit of improv along with your very structured uh, um, techniques. Goal four is empowering students and teachers to become authentic users of a foreign language. This goes back to my, my definition uh, of an authentic text, right? As opposed to it has to be a native user for a native user audience, right? Is that what is the essence of communication? Well, it's really that coming together of the literal and the literary. That's what is the basis of authentic use of language. And again, it doesn't mean that literal texts aren't also authentic, right? But um, it's not the focus, really, uh, and the goal pedagogically. We want students to become, whoops, sorry, uh, uh, um, fuller users of the limited numbers of structures and vocabulary items that they have, right? How do you use those to full extent as opposed to adding more and more other things on and increasing the cognitive load? Goal five is about reframing foreign language studies. So becoming content-based to come back to this question. So language and language culture as creative systems of meaning making becomes the content of your course. I mean, it drove me crazy at Cornell, a research institution, with such a divide between language and literature, where to this day they talk about language classes as being content-less. There's no content to language classes. And I just want to scream, right? Uh, the content of a language course, when it is properly uh, uh, conceptualized and, and scaffolded, is language and language culture. That is content, right? It's not just a mechanical process of filling in blanks. Uh, reframing foreign language studies also 
for this curricular arc that for, for U American university systems, right, at least this articulation between uh, or across language, culture, and literary studies. It's there. And uh, Claire Cromsch, I think at one point said, she was, she was sort of paraphrasing the read my lips kind of notion. <laughs> it's all about language. <laughs> you know, literature is language, right? All of these things, they're instantiations of language. So, so was it, do you remember the quote? No. It's something to that effect. It was kind of like the read my lips, it's all about language. <laughs> anyway, and finally, it's also transdisciplinary across the humanities because when you think of a field of study, it's its own culture. It has its own cultural conventions, its own language, right? So the strategies and skills that students can gain from working with the literary are applicable to any discipline. And I had an interesting conversation with Irani, Irani, um, who works with um, legal texts and translation of legal texts, right? So even what's fascinating is that even and, and legal texts are something this, the striving is to create uh, is is to eliminate the literary, right? Because you don't want these gray areas. You don't want people to interpret too much. You want to try to get to the absolute essence. Well, guess what? It's impossible. <laughs> Right? So you're still going to have layers of, of potential uh, uh, interpretation. But also, even those texts have to use foregrounding in order to get their meaning across. So there's a lot of repetition in those texts. There's a lot of things that you can use that are going to bring out that students need to become aware of, even in a literal text, that's going to be uh, an embodiment of foregrounding of meaning in order to get that meaning across. OK, so those were the, 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 the overreaching goals. And what I want to do now is to take a look and actually, uh, I need a copy of the editorial checklist. Sorry, thank you. So now, what are we looking for? What are reviewers? And when you submit a, a, a flight lesson, and I'm sorry, yeah, I don't have it on, on screen, so um, let's just look at this. Um, the handout that you worked with uh, yesterday morning, um, which is called prep Preparatory Steps uh, for Conceptualizing a Flight Lesson. That's kind of synthesized here in the very first section about uh, preparatory steps. So the first has to do with norms and conventions. Does the lesson show evidence of a sufficient level of understanding of genre conventions, language norms, and conventional cultural practices embedded in the texts? So the viewer, reviewer can, might say, yeah, definitely, or might say, mm, Students uh, uh, not sure that they really understood this particular cultural convention fully. Uh, I'm not seeing evidence of that. I'm seeing, you know, so that gives them then the, the possibility of commenting on that, giving further information, or or asking the the, the the author to provide further information. The literary does the textual analysis adequately identify the meta functions and types of play in the texts? Is there other another? or other types of play that could be identified that would improve the lesson. Different eyes, sets of eyes, are going to see different things in a text. And maybe um, the, the submitter uh, captured uh, um, one category of play that, that they, they work with quite nicely. But maybe there's another category of play that would actually work quite nicely in conjunction with that and for the, the overall objectives of the course. So the reviewer can say, ah, here's another category that, that could be exploited. Messages, themes, are the stated messages and themes adequately supported by evidence in the text? Evidence in, in the text, this is, it, it's so much about that, right? So we're not asking students, especially at the first levels and even at any level, we're not asking them to produce uh, an interpretation of the text that would be the equivalent of a literary scholar. No, it's everything is relative to the, uh, their, their level of, um, uh, uh, of language proficiency. However, the goal is getting students to be able to carry out a viable interpretation based on at least sufficient evidence from the text. Not all of the evidence, not everything, you know, right? But it's, it's, it's that gradable sense of what is sufficient evidence? Because sometimes, you know, uh, left to their own devices, students are just going to interpret based on their um, kind of cultural frame, and they're just going to throw an interpretation at something without really saying, Oh, I see this in the text and this, blah, blah, blah. OK, so that's the goal for messages, themes. And that's really from how you, as the, um, as the author of the text, how you're scaffolding that, 
how are you scaffolding students getting to that point of understanding some of the, the, the basic messages or themes of the text. Now the lesson structure itself, text choice, objectives, and level appropriateness. Um, are the text objectives and level um, well matched to the intended course level? Would the text and lesson be better fitted to a different level? And can the objectives be better stated or envisioned? What's so interesting is that um, over the years that we've done this workshop, a lot of people will find a great text, can construct a nice lesson, and they always put it at a higher level because they think working with the literary is sophisticated and difficult. I'm asking my students to do something they've never done before. Therefore, they gear it to a much higher level. And I've also done reviewing of lessons, and I'll say, you can do this in second semester. You don't have to wait to the advanced level. This is a text that could, could readily be done in, in second semester. Now, here is a question that some people, have, some teachers have to, to work with. If you're in a program where it is um, submersion-like uh, uh, philosophy, uh, where you're not supposed to use, uh, let's say, English as the common language in American university system, you're not supposed to use English in, in your course, that may be a question that you have to work around um, and say the goals of getting students, the goals that we just went through, kind of supersede the need in this particular case. Clearly, you don't want your class to turn into a, a discussion class in English. That's not the point, right? So how much of this is done maybe outside of class, that analytical work, that meta-level thinking, which research shows is much more effectively done in the, the, the native language, uh, you know, the prim first language, primary language. Um, so those are, those are decisions that you need to make. But my philosophy is, and you can see in my textbook, that I start uh, very much in English with a lot of the instructions slowly build in French um, because otherwise, you know, you would have to cut this all out and wait until a much more advanced level before you can really talk about the literary, which is what a lot of standard textbooks do. And, and yet, they never really talk about the literary. So um, next one is scaffolding. Are, there, are a variety of pedagogical modes or acts incorporated? Are the activities sequenced coherently to support learners in, in these two ways? A, moving beyond basic comprehension questions or formal competencies and requiring students to interpret meaning when reading, viewing, listening. So going back to Chantel's uh, uh, presentation yesterday, right? So these pedagogical acts, analysis, right? So comprehension questions are the, um, really the, the, the um, how should I say, the, the, often the only way that standard textbooks get to know if, what students understood about a text. And often those questions are anchored in the literal understanding, the who, what, when, where, why. And they don't go beyond that into really how getting students to notice certain aspects of what is foregrounded, uh, what, how, how is meaning really construed in this text. So we want to see in submitted lessons um, going beyond comprehension questions, getting students uh, to, to really um, think more about how meaning is made. And the second part is developing students' understanding of language use through application of the pertinent areas of language play in the redesigning task, right? So here is where they become empowered. Here is where so much of that learning then uh, comes into play for their own use, is taking what, they're, what they've seen uh, through all this analysis and then making it their own in a new, in a new task, in a new context, in a new uh, situation, and possibly even a different genre, right? that redesigning task. Instructional languages, so the L1 or English and, and the L2 or possibly L3, whatever those languages are in your lesson, are these used pur purposefully and clearly, right? So um, uh, again, my feeling is that you can, you can code switch in, in, uh, uh, in particularly depending on the level, but uh, at the lower levels you can code switch, but you wanna make sure that the languages of instruction uh, are clear and are going to get the results that you're um, stating. Yeah? So is it possible to code switch if you're dealing with higher level students? That's a, that's a call for you to make. So depending on what you're asking, if it's something, if it's a concept that they, um, that you wouldn't, well, how should I say, if it's really a new cultural concept that they don't have a readily usable term for or, or notion for, you can. I mean, my feeling is that 
if it's justifiable, if you as the, the lesson constructor, author, if you can justify use of English or whatever the native, whatever native language you want, yes. But the balance then becomes what, yeah, what, what is, it, if it overbalances, what, what, you know, yeah. So um, I talked about the, the idea of, or not I, but the MLA report talks about translingual, transcultural competence. To me, that often, uh, it requires you to at sometimes evoke different cultural frameworks. So it's easy to do when you go back and forth. Code switching allows you to evoke the different frameworks. So I do, what she's talking about, what Joanna's saying is that it should be purposeful. So if you intentionally want to draw their, their, their attention, students' attention to it, here's the conceptual system of English. When you use this word in English, it has this baggage, and here's what happens in another language. That's purposeful. So uh, um, we're, what we're saying is you can do that as long as it's clear to other people what you're doing. Right, and and um, it makes sense, I think, in in this approach to go back and forth between languages, since that's how it was to operate between two languages, but to do it kind of with a, an awareness that that's what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, within this this uh, section B lesson structure, background and context is sufficient background and contextual information given to students or made available to them through student research. So that's a kind of a question when, when we ask, what do students need to know when it comes to cultural constructs and practices or even uh, grammatical, whatever, what do they need to know at this moment of time within, for this text um, in order for them to s make sufficient meaning out of this text? Um, so you have the choice. Well, you've got three things that you need to decide. One is how much information. Then what form do you want that information to come in? Do you want to provide it for them? It can be links to something that's on, online. It can be something that you write. It can be, you know, whatever, in an image. It can be a video. It can be, or do you want students to go out and do a little bit of research? So again, in that flipped concept, if you want them as, as preparation for the next class to, to do some research on something, sometimes maybe for historical information, if you're talking about a different period of time, you want them to do a little bit of research, but make your research focused, right? If you just say, you know, look at the Enlightenment era, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, they can, they can go to Wikipedia and they can get, they can get a pretty quick sense of it. But, but be, be a little bit more precise, uh, um, be precise in what you want them to look for so they're not just spending hours in the, or coming up with something that's so, so vague or, or, or broad that it's not really applicable or not sufficiently applicable. Yeah. Uh, Mariana, to, uh, she went to Wikipedia. She's looking at a Brazilian author, um, and she, it has a lot of information, but she adapted the Wikipedia. Wikipedia is obviously open. Yeah. So she has that background information about the author. A lot of you will probably want to do that. Yes. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's good practice. And that is something that came up. So even images, if you want to include background information about the author, they'll often, in Wikipedia, they'll often have a picture of the author that is open, and they'll have a text about the author that you can modify and there you can you can include that very readily in your open lesson. Um, so turning your sheet over and continuing still with the notion of lesson, lesson structure is critical feeling and languicality. Does the lesson invoke a critical, a critical feeling along with critical thinking? Does it effectively foster languicality along with languaging? Now these are things that everyone has to kind of define for themselves. And so the reviewer, it's, it, it, we're getting into something that is uh, far from being black and white, right? And it's something that we're all developing a sense of as we go along. So when you first start writing a, a flight lesson, you may not yet really get that, but the reviewer might be able to give you some uh, input um, um, feedback that might help you to go a little bit further with that. But the goal is helping students to then also engage in these dimensions and developing those, those skills and strategies. Again, when it comes to rich points, for example, a lot of it is going to have to be intuitive. It's not, we can't depend when we're out in the real world, we can't depend on, and yes, we do often depend on technology. Well, we go to Wikipedia, we say, oh, I have this question. What, what does this mean? What does this mean? You can often get it. But let's say you don't have your technology and you don't have, uh, you know, a native informant or whatever you want to, you know, right there to answer your questions. Well, you need to develop an intuition about, oh, maybe I'm encountering a cultural construct here that I don't really understand. And once you start developing that sense, that 
that noticing. Then you also start to develop a different way of asking questions and a different way of negotiating those moments. It doesn't mean that you'll avoid all pitfalls, that's impossible, but it makes you better able to, to manage uh, those moments and to not be um, f as f maybe potentially frightened by them or, or stressed or, or, or surprised. I mean, surprise can be a positive thing. It's like, whoa, that's cool, you know? <laughs> yes, you want those moments, those aha moments. Um, perspectivizing cultural activities, so does the lesson consider what kind of social action the text is engaged in and does the lesson relate the text to larger practices or of cultural activities? So kind of, um, yeah, per perspectivizing or contextualizing cultural activities um, kind of works against that notion uh, of culture with a capital C that's often transmitted in textbooks, you know, um, but are you looking further to, to a more um, interpersonal uh, systems-based approach of, you know, what this activity means within that uh, um, um, cultural context to, to other people, et cetera. And finally, assessment, uh, finally for this section, assessment. Assessment is not something that we, that is specifically part of this workshop, right? Um, we're trying, but, but formative assessment is kind of embedded in lessons. And so we do want to be thinking about this. And Chantelle is going to be talking a little bit further about assessment um, this afternoon. But here is at least something. We wanted to start planting seeds. Because as you go along, we're hoping that you will, you will remain in touch with the, the website and, and with the flight project and with us, right? And as we go along and as we start, we are planning to write a teacher's guide, which is going to bring together all of these different dimensions of what we're working with. And once you have that kind of a resource, um, we'll be able to talk uh, a, a lot more about assessment and give examples, et cetera. A quick tip that I say about assessment for the flight approach is that it's not about creating new, unseen modes of assessment. It's about changing your criteria. So you can use rubrics. But the rubric has to include questions about the literary along with the literal. Um, it has to also include maybe broader questions about uh, all these areas of, of language play, right? Whatever areas of language play you're embedding in your lesson, that has to be reflected in, uh, in assessment, um, going beyond comprehension questions, et cetera. So um, here for the editorial checklist, we have our formative assessment modes built into the lesson. Do these modes reflect flight principles? Process over products, so um, designing and redesigning. Peer editing or peer response, so social meaning making or design. And reflection, creative and critical awareness of available designs. And formative assessment, assessment of course, is, is um, profoundly different from summative. Summative is where we get into these standardized tests and practices. And we also have responses to how over time, and you know, you can't change standardized tests overnight. I mean, it's a long process. But once you start working with the flight approach, it's going to start changing the way that you think about language and about teaching. And it's not an overhaul. Uh, it's not overwhelming. You introduce one lesson in your curriculum. And little by little, you start to tweak here and there. And before you know it, over time, you've, you've changed in some kind of profound way your assessment. And so you change the way, I mean, your, your, your curriculum, you change the way that you view assessment and, and include those aspects. You modify. That notion of backwards planning you know, that was introduced a number of years ago in uh, foreign language teaching is that you look at your end goals, and then you make sure that your curriculum and then within that curriculum, your lessons are building toward those end goals. So finally, uh, section C about open education reflects uh, what you've been doing this morning, the licensing and citations. Does the lesson give a URL for copyrighted content, the text, image, video, et cetera, and a CCY or a CC by uh, SA license for open content? So these are all the things that the editorial board members go through their checklist and provide you feedback for because, again, this is about professional development, not about, oh, you failed. <laughs> No thanks. <laughs> it's about, no, we want you to publish. We want you to share. We want you to be part of this, this uh, project.